right, all right, all right. Welcome, everybody. Another episode of Legend Sports and Amplify. We're talking baseball history, Negro League history, card art, collecting, whatever your passion is for baseball, baseball history, the Negro Leagues. And I am really happy today to have on this morning. He's a writer with a uh, online track record with the Atlantic, New Yorker, GQ, Slate, Salon, Daily Beast, you name it. Author Luke Eplin. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks. All right, man. Uh, thank you for taking the time. I think this will be a lot of fun. I, we were talking just a minute before we got on here about um, why I'm doing this, trying to tell the stories, trying to uh, get this context and backstory. Many of it's many of it's centered around the Negro Leagues um, because of the latest announcements that have come out from Major League Baseball and Baseball Reference, and just to try to get people to understand the context, the time period, what was going on at the time, um, and 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 try to fill in what most people don't know. And and I think your book that we're going to talk about today has got a great kind of uh, confluence of all of those events that happened in 1948, and we're going to get to that. But um, what, what I do like to hear is how you got to where you are, your, the origin story that Dr. Brunson likes to call that, and, and, and you know, how you, your career, how you got into his career as a writer, and then this book, which is your first, right? Yes, yeah, my debut book. And 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 why the why that topic and and uh, tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, I, I I imagine I got into writing that for many of the reasons that other people did. I enjoy reading. Uh, I felt compelled to do it. It was something that I've uh, I've done since I was a child. Um, and uh, I grew up in a baseball household. I grew up outside of St. Louis in a small town, so the Cardinals games were always on the radio. My dad is a huge baseball fan, so he passed along that love to me. I grew up reading baseball books such as David Halberstam's October 1964, um, Eight Men Out, you name it, a whole sort of wealth of literature there. My grandfather was a fan of the St. Louis Browns. Um, back in the 40s and 50s, the Cardinals used to have two major league baseball teams, the St. Louis Cardinals, who were usually pretty good, and the St. Louis Browns, who were usually pretty terrible. Um, my grandfather was an odd person in that he liked the Browns. And so I did grew up, grew up hearing stories about the St. Louis Browns, um, more so than a lot of people in St. Louis, because the, the team has been gone there for decades. And anybody who hears any stories about the Browns knows that Bill Beck was the last owner of that team. Um, and uh, Bill Beck, when he owned the Browns in the early to mid 50s, did a lot of the things that he is now known for while owner of that team. He, most notably, he sent a little person, Eddie Goodell, to the plate. Mm -hmm. um, he had fans manage from the grandstands. He shot off fireworks, did sort of circus stunts, all these sorts of things that we now mm -hmm. think about when we think about Bill Beck. And so that was the sort of entry point into my book. I thought Bill Beck was an incredible character, mm -hmm. and I wanted to write about um, the Browns and sort of honoring the sort of family uh, connection that we had to it. But it was while researching Bill Beck that I looked into his earlier tenure as owner of the Indians in the mid to late 40s. And I started noticing all these other names coming to the surface, Larry Doby, Satchel Paige, Bob Feller. And I realized that what Bill Beck should be most known for is that he is the first owner of the American League to integrate a team. And I saw with these sort of different characters, Feller, Page, Doby, Beck, that you could tell a sort of alternate story of integration than the one that we commonly hear about, which centers on Jackie Robinson. But there was another story of integration in Major League Baseball that was happening at the same time as the Jackie Robinson story, but looked very different than than that story so that's kind of the entry point into my book i i think it's a it's a fantastic topic and it's really interesting like you said as a writer i'm sure this happens quite a bit you start down one rabbit hole so to speak and then you wind up somewhere else and and the thing i really enjoyed about your book was that i mean i i love um historical 
uh, novels. Uh, I, I enjoy, you know, more than just the history. I like I like hearing it from the human perspective and and be, it being told as a story with characters because really it is. And, and, and that's the way you've kind of approached this. You, you've kind of, I mean, because there's plenty of writing out there about, certainly about Satchel Paige, uh, certainly about, uh, you know, Bob Feller. Um, not as much maybe about Larry Doby is, is known because he's a little bit more, you know, uh, quieter, I guess, uh, personality. Bill Veck as, as well. But you've, you've taken like kind of almost like four biographies in your, in your book, Our Team, woven them into a story and how they all came together uh which i think is fascinating yeah well that that is actually the way that i approached this book what i figured was as you said there are biographies written about each of these four men three of the four wrote autobiographies mm -hmm. in fact feller page and beck each wrote more than one autobiography they sort of were telling their life stories throughout their entire lives so they, they was a sort of form of currency their own their own narratives but what i thought when i was researching this period was that it was so tremendously exciting it it, it sort of incited a frenzy around cleveland this 1948's mm -hmm. indians team and just all the things that were sort of swirling around uh, the the era then it was the post war period. People finally had money. Um, they were finally sort of getting back to their normal lives. Integration was happening. Mm -hmm. Things like barnstorming was going on. Bill Veck was reinventing the stadium experience by sort of shooting off fireworks and adding sort of entertainment into a baseball game, the likes of which hadn't been seen before. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to myself that what we're perhaps missing about this thing is the excitement and the narrative of it. Yes. And so I really wanted to tell this like a novel in a way that would sort of put the reader in the middle of it and make them feel just how sort of like not only exciting, but earth shattering this team would have been. I mean, you can say Larry Doby was the second black player to come in the league. You can say Satchel Paige made it into Major League Baseball at 42. You can say Bob Feller sort of reinvented the idea of the athlete businessman. And those are all interesting facts. But what do they feel like in the moment? And so I really thought that that's what was lost, the sort of immediacy of the narrative. And so that's really where I focused a lot of my energies in this book. I think it's fantastic because it, it, it brings to, um, to the reader, like you just pointed out, it's, it's, it's more an experience. M many times you read a biography, uh, you read a history of a team or a time period, it's it's dates and facts and 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 it, it's hard to get you know emotionally involved in that but when you write a book from the perspective like you did it, uh, it it makes you become part of that experience and i think that that's that's what makes it a lot of fun uh and you've got uh, quite a cast of characters here i mean um you, you know your title mentions larry doby and satchel page uh because of the integration uh, i'm sure but you know the 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 Indians, I mean, they hadn't won a World Series in almost 30 years. And, and so I'm sure that, that the city was already geared up. They came close, I think, a few years prior in the 40s. But um, yeah. they were already geared up for, for this. And like you pointed out, it was post-World War II. Um, so first thing I wanted to uh, talk to you about real quick is um, what made Cleveland this type of a environment for this uh, in, in talking to uh, professor ruck pittsburgh was another city because of the uh the great migration uh from the south of african americans uh, in the in the 20s and 30s and, and beyond uh pittsburgh with the industry the confluence of of the railroads and and it became a center uh, as did many other northern cities chicago obviously and so forth what was it about cleveland the same the same type was the manufacturing what what attracted uh cleveland it, it it was very similar i guess to, to the way that it would have it would have been in pittsburgh cleveland was a city that was growing by leaps and bounds at the turn of the 20th century it had a tremendous manufacturing base right there on lake erie it was in sort of close proximity to most of the major eastern cities it was a major waterway a major rail station uh Passover place and it just kind of had a diversified industrial base that was causing tons of European immigrants, particularly from Eastern Europe, uh -huh. to fill 
flocked to this city at the start of that 20th century. It went through a sort of uh, contraction in the 1930s with the Great Depression. So it was the first time that Cleveland had ever really lost population in, since its founding. And but wow. the sort of start of the war, World War II, that would have been in the 1940s, revived its industrial base as a sort of geared towards more sort of war production. And then coming out of the war with the industry already at its height, it transitioned back into being sort of a major industrial, uh, major industrial player for all of these goods and services that the uh, post-war baby boom was going to need. And so it had the sort of roaring manufacturing base by the time that Build Back buys the team in 1946. You also have around the time of World War II, especially an influx of African-American residents from the South, most notably from Alabama, which is where a lot of these people came from, the sort of great migration northward. They came there to try to sort of get a foothold into the industrial base that was then uh, roaring in, in, in the wartime. A lot of the jobs were sort of menial that they got, but they used the war as sort of leverage to fight for their rights. And so in 1945, you have Cleveland forming one of the first sort of municipal councils to look at discrimination and prejudice within mm. the workplace. And then that sort of strengthens uh, laws against sort of segregation and workplace situations and sort of investigatory work that these bodies could do if one was sort of uh, alleging discrimination. So much so that by the time that uh, the Indians win the World Series in 1948, a magazine like Ebony Magazine is saying Cleveland has the most progressive race relations of any major city in uh, the United States. And so it had a sort of uh, an African-American wow. base already there that would have been primed to support a team that um, that integrates and in fact they did and then you had sort of the cleveland indians who had been owned by this this syndicate of very wealthy clevelanders um since the 20s and they didn't do much to sort of uh you know interest the common fan they didn't do much in terms of promotion things like this they weren't all that good at team building um and so indians fans were a little bit disgruntled but still passionate about the team they were primed for someone like bill beck to come in and really court them woo them bring them to the park with promotions and then sort of build up this championship club so you had this sort of like confluence of both sort of the industrial base coming back clevelanders ready to let loose after basically a decade of hardship a, a sort of firm African-American base there already in that city that was going to support uh, integration. And you had an Indians club that hadn't won for a long time, but the fans were sort of ready for it to finally get back on its feet. Awesome. And, you know, on top of all that, too, didn't they also um, the f integrated professional football just prior to that as well, right? Weren't they the first city to do that or one of the first as well? So it was yeah, already primed. Yeah, they did that actually before the Indians integrated. Mm -hmm. um, they brought on two African-American players onto the Cleveland Browns and rather than uh, attendance suffering, it was the opposite. Mm -hmm. The Browns led football in attendance and won the championship. And there were sort of a host of, of black athletes that were coming out of Cleveland at that time. I think that everybody would, would, would immediately leap to Jesse Owens, who is a Cleveland product, but also Harrison Dillard within the uh, track world. He won four gold medals in, in track as well. And then you had the Cleveland Buckeyes, which was the Negro mm. League club in Cleveland. They won the Negro League World Series in 1945 and had a wealth of incredible players there, including Sam Jethro and Quincy Troop and some others. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was this already an established base of black excellence in terms of athletics in Cleveland. Absolutely. And now, like you mentioned, bring a, a, an owner in that was innovative and and uh, a character, really. I mean, like you mentioned some of the things already. I mean, I don't know how many people know that. When he was with the White Sox, right, he, he actually had a night where uh, fans could hold up signs and and, uh, and manage the game from the stands. <laughs> Wasn't this something crazy? I mean, he, he did all sorts of crazy things. I mean, um, and, and uh, now 1947 comes along. He does something. And Larry, Larry Doby, I mean, uh, uh, boy, Jackie Robinson for... for Rightfully so, it is is the first to integrate baseball uh, in 1947. However, Larry Doby 
uh, it seems to be always like the, not I don't want to say the forgotten man, but he, he's, there's less interest in his story, but he was the first in so many things. I mean, he was the first uh, in the American League. He went directly from Newark almost the next day, wasn't it? Uh, right to the Cleveland Indians. I mean, unlike Jackie Robinson, who spent a year in the minors. Yeah, I mean, you really have to sort of look at these as two very different stories that that were going on in terms of integration. Jackie Robinson was somebody who played college football at UCLA. He was such a star there that that white and black fans would have known who he was. He had sort of national recognition in that sense. He only played for a year in the Negro Leagues before he was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers organization. Branch Rickey in particular was the one who instigated this. He was the Brooklyn Dodgers president. And he sort of reasoned that sending Robinson directly to the majors would have been sort of unfair to him because mm-hmm. the pressure would have been tremendously great. And he wouldn't have had time to acclimate to that sort of all white space that uh, that was Major League Baseball at that time. So they sent him to the minors for a year in 1946 to the Montreal Royals. And so he has a chance to find his footing, to adjust to some of the problems that he will encounter time and time again throughout his career. And also for the white teammates of the Brooklyn Dodgers to sort of wrap their minds around the fact that integration is happening and it's going to be coming soon. He also goes to spring training twice with the Dodgers. So he knows people at this time. And he's, he's older than Larry Doby. By the time he, he comes in the league, he's 28. And so he's a more mature person who's had sort of experiences that can prep him for this, even though the experience was so hard on him. Larry Doby, in contrast, was somebody who went to an integrated high school in New Jersey. He was a a high school star Mm -hmm. who went directly to the Newark Eagles, which was this great Negro League Negro League team at that time. He's drafted into the Navy where he is at segregated bases and he comes back from the war and rejoins the Eagles. He's only 23 years old in 1947. Nobody in white baseball really knows who he is. He hasn't sort of crossed over um, from sort of black fandom to white fandom. When Vex signs him, Vex wants help immediately. Mm-hmm. He wants the Indians to improve quickly. He realizes that Larry Doby is one of the sort of top players and prospects and believes not only that Larry Doby can 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 just go directly to the majors, but that it would be uh, it would it might put more pressure on him if if he were to send him down to the minors. And besides, a lot of the minor league clubs in Cleveland were in the South, which would have been very difficult for Larry Doby to play there. Mm-hmm. So Larry Doby literally goes overnight from Mm -hmm. the Negro Leagues to the Major Leagues. He plays on the Newark Eagles on July 4th, 1947, boards an overnight train. The very next day, he's Mm -hmm. suiting up for the Cleveland Indians. It is a whirlwind. He doesn't have time to wrap his mind around this. And so really that whole first year of 1947, he is just like completely a nervous wreck. He is isolated. He's dealing with segregation in terms of not being able to stay in the same hotel as his teammates, not being able to eat with his teammates, not even having a roommate at a time whenever all these players room together with someone else. And so the sort of isolation and loneliness is really affecting him deeply, along with sort Mm -hmm. of the abuse that he's suffering. Um, He said that during his first 10 or so times up in the major leagues, he could not stop his teeth from chattering. And so he's he's quite uh, unlike Jackie Robinson, who really thrives in 1947. Larry Doby, um, I guess it's safe to say. Yeah. 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 And so that's why when 1948 comes along, there is it's almost like vindication for both him, uh, Satchel Paige in a way as well, because of, of his, I mean, they say he was 42, allegedly, <laughs> when he yeah. finally makes it in 48. Uh, and then a little bit, I guess, for um, uh, for Vec as well, because uh, I, I'm sure because of the way it was all handled, now signing a 42-year-old-ish Satchel Paige, I'm sure he took some... Um, uh, I don't want to say some uh, abuse, but I'm sure he had some blowback on that. So why are you signing this guy at his age? And and Doby right from the Negro Leagues into the Indians. I'm sure that there was a lot of of uh, pushback um, yeah. on him. Yeah, I mean, think. Of, I mean, it is it is hard to imagine, but you really have to sort of think of the courage that it took for Beck to stand behind his convictions here. Mm-hmm. I mean, the sort of safe route would have been to send these individuals to the minor leagues and then if they don't work out there to just sort of 
release them as Branch Rickey did to several players mm -hmm. that he signed into the minor leagues. Vec had a lot of faith in these these individuals because he'd grown up in Chicago, which oh. was sort of the nerve center of the Negro Leagues at that time. He saw a lot of Chicago American Giants games when he was growing up. And he also uh, went to the East-West All-Star Game, which is where the sort of top Negro League players competed in an All-Star Game. So w when he comes to Cleveland, he does several interviews with the Black Paper of Cleveland at that time, the Colin Post, and they're impressed not only that Bill Beck knows the names of Negro League players, but he can tell you the positions they played, like what sort of hitter they are, what sort of fielder they are. He studied and knows the Negro Leagues, and he awesome. really believes that the Negro League players are on par with the Major League players, which was not a popular belief among white executives and players at that time. And so he thinks that Larry Doby can help the Indians. And even whenever Larry Doby really does not seem like he's major league worthy in 1947, Bill Veck is going into the off season, making bets with people that Larry Doby will be on the team the next year. He has that much faith in him. And the same thing with Satchel Paige. I mean, Satchel Paige, everybody was pretty much, even the ones that doubted the sort of readiness of the Negro leagues would have to sort of hedge when it came to Satchel Paige because he was just that good. Mm -hmm. But by the time 19, the war is over, Paige is into his 40s. Most of the people that he came up with as players have retired. Mm -hmm. And it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of common knowledge that Paige is simply too old to make his debut into the major leagues. But Bill Veck has been watching Paige for like 12 years. And whenever the Indians are sort of in desperate need of pitching reinforcements in 1948, he really rolls the dice and puts his reputation on the line and signs Satchel Paige. And he received tremendous blowback for that. People thought he was doing it just as a stunt because mm -hmm. Bill Beck was known for stunts, setting off fireworks and things like this. Mm -hmm. They thought, oh, you're just doing this to attract fans. But Beck was adamant, even at the time in the newspapers, that he's doing this because he is certain Satchel Paige will help the club. And in fact, he does. Satchel Paige wins six games that year. Mm -hmm. And considering that the Indians needed all of those six games for the championship, uh, Page is really a huge reason why the Indians make it to the World Series. Mm -hmm. For people who are not familiar with that, they actually end in a regular season tie with the Boston Red Sox, <clears throat> which they win. I, I think the score was 7-3, uh, 8-3, something like that. And then yeah. they go on to beat the Braves in the uh, in the World Series and and uh, yeah so it was an, an epic season all the way around so so you've got this cast of characters you've got the the, the more subdued Larry Doby you've got the uh, the obvious you know charm and charisma and flamboyance of a satchel page you've got similar traits uh, and innovation um, from Bill Veck, but now you've got another superstar. You've actually got a couple. Lou Boudreau was the manager, uh, which yeah. a player manager, and he was player manager when he was like 25 or something, several years earlier. So blows me away that that whole thing. But that was before Veck's time. But now you've got uh, you've got another superstar in the mix, <clears throat> and that's Bob Feller, who um, came in at 17 years old into the major leagues and just, uh, you know, it thrived, he excelled. Uh, and his personality, though, was a lot different than the others that we're talking about, right? Yeah, Bob Fuller, I think, has an origin story that still hasn't been matched in baseball. He grew up on a farm in central Iowa. By the time he was a, a, a about 10 years old, his father just sensed this tremendous ability in his son. And so a few years later, he cleared off a portion of his farmland and built Feller a baseball diamond right there. It was essentially the original Field of Dreams there. Mm -hmm. And Feller sort of just blows away the competition so much so that he makes the Indians at the age of 17 in his very first start ever. He ties the American League record in strikeouts. Incredible. Four starts after that, he ties the major league record. He's only 17. Mm -hmm. By the time he's 18 and a senior in high school, he's so popular that his high school graduation is broadcast live on the radio from coast to coast. Oh my I goodness. mean, he, there really isn't kind of an equivalent that I can think of of this sort of figure. Um, but the way that I have Feller in there is that he's also instrumental in this story about integration because he becomes a huge sensation on the barnstorming circuit. Mm -hmm. Barnstorming was something that was done back then 
uh, usually in October for major league players right up to the season ends as a way of sort of making money after the season and before the, the cold weather really sets in. They would usually team up with other sort of white players or minor leaguers or at times black teams, mm -hmm. players made up of the Negro League players, mm -hmm. and sort of tour the country, go to places where Major League Baseball wasn't played, and play these exhibition games where they could pick up some extra money before the, the winter came. And so Feller was a tremendous draw on these on these circuits for fans who wouldn't have had a chance to see them. And they especially like to see Bob Feller square off against Satchel Paige. And so Feller and Paige became this sort of uh, rivalry or duo that 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 played against each other dozens and dozens of times from 1936 to 1947. In fact, in 1946, the year after the war, they team up for this elaborate barnstorming tour that sort of goes coast to coast, airplanes, giant stadiums, the whole nine yards. And they draw 250,000 fans that month. I mean, it is a sensation. And so Bob Feller, like he himself had sort of maybe a little bit more traditionalist views of race relations at the time, but through these barnstorming tours, he really helped expose the talents and abilities of these players because he would often get beat by these teams of, of Negro League players. And so it really kind of undercut this idea that these mm -hmm. these players weren't major league worthy. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, he's a really fascinating figure. And I think he's an excellent counterpoint to Satchel Paige because they were two of the most entrepreneurial minded athletes of Absolutely. their time. They really built themselves up into brands and businesses and they made tremendous amounts of money um, not only on their feats on the field, but on the way that they could exploit those feats in the marketplace. So they're sort of the forerunners of the the athlete as businessman. And that's a, another kind of a underlying theme <clears throat> in your book of of another aspect of how this season uh, helped to change the future of the sport, sports in general, really. I mean, as far as that aspect of it, because yes, players became like them, uh, more and more, uh, like you just pointed out, a, a brand in themselves, a brand within a brand, so to speak, I guess. And and then yeah. Bill Veck, uh, you know, the orchestrator of all of this. Um, but, you know, 1948 comes along and, and some of the crowds and, and, and you know, when I when I, I, I listen to your book uh, as I drive around <laughs> as opposed to reading it, but, but the... Yeah. Um, some of the things that really stuck out, which I really enjoyed, were the descriptions of the crowds and the the atmosphere and, and what it was like to be there. I mean, it, this was an experience like we talked about earlier. Yeah, I mean, he had troubadours and jugglers and, and uh, vaudeville acts and fireworks and all sorts of things to make this an experience. But when these crowds came, because we're talking Municipal Stadium is massive. 70 what was it 76,000 78,000 78,000 yeah. so when Satchel Paige makes that first start which is just a few weeks ago the anniversary of it in August right um I I did he even did Bill Veck even expect that type of of uh of response to this because I I, I had heard you know that even he was overwhelmed by the whole uh prospect that it was bigger than him even <laughs> Yeah, Vex said that many times in the moment. Um, I mean, Municipal Stadium in Cleveland held 78,000 people. It was built in the 1930s as a way of sort of attracting uh, larger sorts of events, whether the Olympics or, or any of these sort of circus events that could have happened. And the Indians were going to play there as well. But the Indians were struggling to draw like five to 10,000 people. And so you would be in that stadium and it would just look empty because it was such a huge stadium and when bill Vec comes into town in the the 40s he looks at that stadium and says oh my gosh imagine what it would be like to fill that thing yeah. and anybody would have said oh you're crazy no one could fill that thing but he does he is consistently drawing 50 60 70 even 80 000 fans into that stadium um just based on his own sort of charisma and the sort of entertainment that he brings along with the competitive team that he assembles for the Indians. But whenever he adds Satchel Paige to the mix, it becomes something else entirely. Satchel Paige at that time, at the age 42, had crossed over from sort of being the sort of foremost idol of, of black baseball fans 
choose somebody that, that even white fans that knew nothing about the Negro Leagues would have heard of him. There were features that were running in mainstream presses like the Saturday Evening Post, Time Magazine, New York Times, all these things. Satchel Page could really sort of cross over into both baseball realms. And so people that had heard these stories of Satchel Page had sort of heard the legend of Satchel Page, especially, were eager to finally see him in person and then uh, black fans that had known him and his feats in the negro leagues were finally ready to see satchel page pitch in the minors after 20 years of not being able to do so and mm -hmm. so it created this sort of frenzy that happened that everywhere satchel page went whenever it was announced that he was starting it was just like tickets disappeared so mm -hmm. much so that in Imagine. chicago where uh where page started a game against the the white Sox at comiskey park Fans were lining up hours beforehand. This park held about 50,000 people. Well, they tore out one of the turnstiles and then just flooded in. And so they estimated that there were 70 some thousand fans in, in that stadium that held 50,000. People were having wow. to sort of go underneath the bleachers because there was no more room for people in there. I mean, it was just people were, were it, it was like a frenzy, almost, almost I guess Amazing. you could compare it to like Beatlemania or something like that. Amazing. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. I mean, even as a fan of Cleveland, and if you, you're talking a stadium that's that big, that has five, six thousand people in it, and yeah. now, just a few years later, seventy-eight thousand, and probably more. Who knows what they were able to uh, to cram in there for these events? I mean, that's just fantastic for the the city. Uh, for uh, the whole, you know, uh, brand of baseball. You know, you wonder why it took some of these guys so long to get on board with some of this. And, and you know, and that's one thing I, I try to point out, and you touched on it a little bit before, about the barnstorming aspect with Bob Feller and, and Satchel Paige. Um, many fans who maybe have no knowledge or limited knowledge of the Negro Leagues, they look at statistics now and they see like you pointed out, the shorter seasons, 50, 60, 70 games tops. But really, those guys were playing many more than that, two and three times more than that, 150 to 200 games because of the barnstorming that they were doing. And that was something that I think that Satchel Page was at times, uh, he, he kind of flipped that on, on backwards where uh, it, it was said that Negro League teams didn't work as hard. They weren't, you know, didn't have that ethic. And he was like, Wait a minute. We we work a lot harder than you guys do. <laughs> so. It's so fascinating because Satchel Page, you know, to a lot of white to a lot of white fans at that time, Satchel Page, he was even described in places like the Washington Post and others as being sort of the clown pitcher of the Negro Leagues. People right. thought of him as almost like a sideshow act or a circus show or something like that. And a lot of people that came to Indians games were surprised to see such a serious person on the mound, somebody who really took mm -hmm. his craft extremely seriously once once the the game started there's a fascinating section where bob feller and satchel page are barnstorming against each other in 1941 and an enterprising reporter in ohio i believe in dayton rushes into both locker rooms after the game i believe that satchel page's team had won and asked bob feller what he thought of satchel page and bob feller is very equivocal he kind of says well he's got a great fastball but he doesn't seem to want to throw it very often and he hasn't sort of built up another uh, more arsenal of his pitches his curveball isn't all that good and you can see in fellas response this sort of um stereotype that that the black player is sort of getting by on natural talent that he's a little bit lazier he hasn't built up his arsenal this sort of thing you see the sort of stereotype that is underlying that response and then whenever page is inter interviewed he sort of talks about how that he's turning it on his head He's saying we we not only are not lazy, they're the lazy ones. Like they, <laughs> they only pitch every four games. I'm pitching all the time. Heck, if I went to the major leagues, it'd be like I was on vacation. Sometimes because twice a day. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, Paige is really sort of like very smartly subverting the stereotype that a lot of white players had about black athletes and sort of throwing it back in their face, like. Page is is just has this incredible intelligence and intuition to be able to do that, mm -hmm. and so it, it's a really sort of smart way that he has of, of resisting that line of thinking. It's interesting, right? Because um, you know many of those stereotypes, and 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 you know, um, 
folklore mythology aside with with the Negro Leagues um, because there's there's so many stories that that uh, you can that have been told uh, you know cool Papa Bell so fast he could uh, <laughs> get in bed before the light the light the room got dark kind of thing but all of those stories are an important part of the Negro League history because as we've been talking about the keys to the kingdom so to speak were controlled by white men uh, both the press uh, for a large degree there was many great black newspapers at the time that were covering it as well but the press um, obviously the ownership in the, in the major leagues uh, who, who uh, uh, what stories were being told I mean uh, the commissioner of the game at the time uh, Kennesaw Mountain Landis all of these uh, guys who had the keys to the kingdom were not going out of their way to really uh, obviously not promote black baseball players so those stories is, are, are an important part because it, it, it made people pay attention. <clears throat> it became a folklore, so to speak, but without those stories and the continuation of telling those stories, you know, many of these conversations that we've had, you know, or having now or in the past couple of years would never have even happened. Well, I think those stories also, if we want to talk just about Satchel Page, those stories were important in another way. Like Satchel Page comes into the into the Negro Leagues at the end of the 1920s. And so he really hits his prime during the Depression, right whenever the Depression is at its worst point in sort of the early 30s mm -hmm. and into the mid 30s. And this is at a time whenever the Negro Leagues are, if not in a state of collapse, at least in a state of dire financial straits, mm -hmm. where money is very hard to come by. A lot of teams sort of go under. Um, it becomes even more sort of precarious than, than it had been. And so what Central Page was able to do during that time, I think, is the most entrepreneurially impressive thing that any athlete has ever accomplished. He builds himself not only into perhaps the best pitcher of that era, but he builds himself into somebody who is making as much money as a major league superstar mm -hmm. during that time and in a league that is struggling financially during also a time whenever it was very difficult for black athletes to get sort of endorsement deals this the sort of which bob feller got immediately as soon as he comes into the league with you know things like wilson gloves or mm -hmm. with cigarette companies or soda companies or whatever central page doesn't have that because a lot of sort of executives didn't believe that black athletes could market to white fans and so Page has to sort of rely on sort of his own savvy and sort of utilizing these stories and these narratives to build himself up into what becomes kind of a larger than life figure. He becomes mm -hmm. kind of a one man franchise through the dissemination of this sort of mythology, folklore, stories, things like that. So much so that, you know, just the announcement that Satchel Page was going to be taking the mound was enough yes. to draw five to 10,000 extra fans there. And Page usually took a cut of the gate. And so these stories really helped him become what I think is the most entrepreneurial success athlete that this company has, and this country has ever known. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can draw a straight line from Satchel Page to someone like Michael Jordan and LeBron James. Mm -hmm. Just the sort of template that he kind of establishes and the way that he utilizes his narrative is, is I think more impressive than even Bob Feller, who I think also was one of the most entrepreneurial athletes. But the sort of challenges that Satchel Page faced and the way that he built himself up into this money-making machine, I think is, is incredible and shows amazing business sense and intuition. Interesting. It's a great point. I mean, I, I've pointed this out a couple of times in these conversations. One of the things that always sticks, sticks out to me in all this is, uh, like you just pointed out, during the Depression, uh, when money was tight uh, and, and I, I often don't think the Negro Leagues get as much credit as they deserve with helping to spread the brand of baseball to all parts of the country I mean literally everywhere on the, in the continent the Caribbean uh, you know Canada you name it there wasn't yeah. too many places that there wasn't a player a tour a, a game uh, that that was associated with it but it brought professional baseball to every single corner of the country and people were paying good money to see these guys. Money that was hard to come by, certainly during the Depression, hard-earned. And, and yet they were doing it to see these guys play. I think that that you know, kind of a test, is a testament to that they understood, you know, these guys were pretty good. <laughs> you know, yeah, 
1936, that, that's whenever Bob Feller and Satchel Paige first face each other at a sort of barnstorming game in Iowa. Bob Feller is 17 years old, Satchel Paige is 30. They're already sort of, um, this is the start of the rivalry. They're playing underneath the 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 lights of a minor league stadium in des moines and now this is at a time whenever only one major league team the cincinnati reds had lighting systems for night games and so a night game for feller would have been kind of a novelty because very few teams had it it was kind of in the minor leagues was coming up but a night game for central page would not have been a novelty mm -hmm. because the negro leagues during that time in the depression in order to sort of make ends meet have to improvise have to sort of invent have to sort of use ingenuity and so they are devising these sort of ways of sort of putting lights up from a truck onto the field so that they could play not only during the day but mm -hmm. also at night to make more money and so the Negro Leagues are really sort of the innovator of things like night baseball mm -hmm. and all these other sorts of things. Like they, they are, they're the leagues that, that is showing more ingenuity mm -hmm. than the major leagues. Absolutely. Uh, now it's interesting. I, I just, just in talking to you, this thought crossed my mind <clears throat> because we just had to feel the dreams game not that yeah. long ago. And you mentioned about uh, the heater from Van Meter <laughs> was mm -hmm. what Feller was known as from Iowa. And, and, uh, you know, somewhere along the line, and maybe Field of Dreams, the movie, had something to do with that. There, there's, I don't want to call it a myth, but that this belief that, you know, baseball is all this pastoral, you know, heartland out in the cornfields type of a game. It's really not. I mean, it began in the, in the big cities. It began in the East Coast, and it, yeah. and it grew from there. Uh, so it's interesting that you mentioned that about his father. I didn't know that, building him yeah. his own... Uh, um, baseball field so that he could practice on it. That's, that's an well, interesting topic. Bob Feller's origin story is not only, I think, the sort of the sort of most uh, most sort of improbable in that he made it to the major leagues as a 17 year old and sort of broke records. You have to sort of ask yourself why was it resonating so much in the country? Why did his graduation uh -huh. ceremony go coast to coast? And it was because, especially during the Depression and those sort of lean years, it harkened back to the sort of, you know, uh -huh. American mythology and archetypes of this sort of like, you know, uh, traditional sort of farm grown sort of family that through their own work ethic and by pulling themselves up by the bootstraps and by doing all the right things, you know, mm -hmm. drinking milk, working hard, building baseball diamonds in their farm, makes it into the majors. It is essentially the sort of mythology of the American dream. And mm -hmm. I think that it's no, it's no mistaking the fact that it takes place in Iowa and largely rural white communities, because mm -hmm. that is sort of what that origin story is 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 generally about and so the reason why that was so resonant back then was because all of the archetypes and mythology that we like to think about in terms of baseball being this pastoral thing and and the sort of american dream being this sort of thing where you can you can build yourself up and then become mm -hmm. this amazing thing by your own work ethic and pulling yourself up is encased within that but my book what i'm trying to do is show that like my book starts with the Bob Feller origin story that is chapter one and sort mm -hmm. of gets you into that but then it ends with the Larry Doby origin story which mm -hmm. is a much different origin story and I think equally as impressive and improbable as Bob Feller and that is a more urban a more a more sort of uh, uh, you know a black story one that mm -hmm. sort of um, has a lot of different beats than this sort of more traditionalist thing that we talk about. So it's the the book is kind of passing from the Bob Feller version of baseball into a more mm -hmm. Larry Doby version of baseball, which makes it more narratively makes baseball more narratively complex than mm -hmm. it would have been at that time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, and and uh, how you what one of the things I, I enjoyed. If maybe you can just uh, uh, touch on this. Um, you you you've taken four stories, woven them together, shown how they passed each other 
in, yeah. in the past with how they interacted, which I think that's something about history and the way it's taught. It, it, it's people tend to think of it as being linear. It just goes forward and you have dates and places and people and you just keep on going forward. It's kind of not that way. It's a little more amorphous than that. You know, the, the things, they, they, they intersect and then they, they move away from each other and then they come back together again. And so that's the, the thing about this, this story that's fascinating is how those four personalities had many crossovers in the past, never knowing that years later, in 1948, they would wind up uh, becoming, you know, World Series champions. I, I think it's fascinating. How did you do the, the, the research for some of this? Well, it's, you know, it's interesting. The, the book, this book was pitched and was bought by my publisher as a much different story. I thought this was before I knew a lot about the story. I thought the book was really just going to be a straightforward narrative that started mm -hmm. with Larry Doby integrating the Indians. And then I thought that I would sort of move through the 1947 ah. season and then move through the 1948 season and I would fill in the backstories as needed. But when I started doing the research, which, is, which involved a lot of archival sort of research uh, in the newspapers, a lot of talking to these, the family members that are still alive, things like this, I realized that you can't start this story in 1947 because these four individuals, Bob Feller, Larry Doby, Satchel Paige, Bill Beck, were circling each other even sort mm -hmm. of a decade before that. Yes. And they were sometimes directly crossing as Bob Feller and Satchel Paige did and as, as Satchel Paige and Bill Beck did. But they were also kind of, they were having experiences that rhymed. Similar. Mm -hmm. So like Bob Feller goes to World War II and joins the Navy and has this sort of very intense experience as a Navy, but is kind of a, a, somebody who is, is very well known. He's tracked in the Navy. Um, he's raising money for war bonds. He goes out to, to, to sea and sort of becomes a, a, you know, a, a prominent member on this battleship. Whereas Larry Doby also joins the Navy, trains in the same place that Bob Feller did and goes to the South Pacific with Bob Feller, but has a totally different experience because mm -hmm. the Navy is segregated. Mm -hmm. It really sort of teaches him that this country thought of him as a second-class citizen. Larry Doby gains a tremendous racial consciousness from from that experience in the Navy. And that's happening sort of concurrently with Feller, even though I don't believe that the two ever cross paths. Mm -hmm. But I thought that you had to sort of show how they had they they were in the same branch of the service at the same time, but had these vastly different experiences that shaped these individuals. And so I really thought that like the way that you could tell this story is to sort of look at the places where they intersect or have sort of similar sorts of similar sorts of uh, experiences or are, are in sort of similar sorts of places and sort of use those sorts of things as a way of sort of weaving these narratives together. I mean, it's, it's truly it's, incredible that these four men eventually joined forces because yes. they're circling each other for 12 time. years before they finally come together. It's fascinating. And like I said, it, it really is more the way history is. Uh, it's yeah. not linear. It's not straight line. An event leads to event leads to event and cause and effect. There is a lot of this in and out and 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 kind of uh, coming and going and weaving and touching and sometimes not even knowing. Uh, it's fascinating. Hats off to you, man. I mean, this this was. I, I it's it's a great book. I I highly recommend people pick it up. Uh, our team, Larry Doby, Satchel Page, and the World Series that changed baseball. Uh, what are you working on next? Well, you know, to be honest, uh, I, as somebody who's not an Indians fan and did not grow up in Cleveland, I knew very little about this story going into it. And while I was researching it and sort of uncovering things, I was like, oh my goodness, this is the greatest baseball story I've ever heard. Right. And so I kind of thought to myself, after it's I fascinating. It, I mean, I'm not saying that I wrote it the best way that is mm -hmm. possible. I'm just saying that the story itself, yes. regardless of my book, is incredible. It's yep. amazing. It has all of these great figures. It has all this sort of drama. Um, and so I thought to myself, I don't think I could tell a better baseball story than this. Mm -hmm. And so I am looking to do something similar in professional basketball. That's all I'll say for now. Okay. All right. Fair <laughs> enough, man. No, it's great. I, I, I enjoyed it. I think, like I said, I, I don't, unfortunately, because of the drive I often have here in the Houston area, I yeah. spend a lot of time in my car. And it's a great time for me to just flip on uh, Audible 
and uh, and listen uh, and pass the time. And, and like I said, I, I really, really enjoyed it. I, it. It's one of my favorite, uh, I mean, obviously baseball, but the, the favorite, my favorite ways of, of the telling of history. And like you pointed out, this story, uh, I, I don't, it, it's bigger than most people, I think, have known because you know often things on either side of it tend to overshadow uh, certain aspects of certain events and and I think you did a great job of of uh, you know trying to raise some of these points these personalities this team this season uh, to where it probably deserves to be a little bit more in uh, in baseball history so like I said hats off to you man I, I appreciate your work and uh, uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, I, down the road, you know, uh, if you got something else coming up down the road, I'll be in touch and maybe we get you back on here again. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, Luke. Thank you very much. You have a great day. All right. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.